welcome to the Edelweiss Emerging Ideas 2020, our second virtual conference as we sail through the pandemic. This is our seventh conference, and we hope like every year, day one today has added to our knowledge curve. 2020 has rather been a peculiar year with two extreme phases, one being the absolute containment era of April and May, and the second being rather the rest of 2020, a cycle of partial opening up as we coexist with COVID and start life with relevant SOPs. And the investor sentiment has moved from one extreme to the other. So while in the start of 2020 prevailed extreme pessimism, today we have extreme optimism as far as risky assets market is concerned. And it's very important for an investor to cultivate discipline and an ability to unbiasedly look at data, whichever extreme of emotion we are at. Joining us today is Mr. James Brody, who will speak on how human behavioral biases affect our ability to invest logically and consistently. After which we will address the audience questions. So feel free to use the chat box to pass us the questions. Now, James holds a chartered market technician designation and is a senior consultant at Intuition and a board member of the CMT Association with close to 25 years of experience trading in financial markets. He was a director at Credit Suisse Trading Interest Rate Derivatives, FX and Options, and was based in London, New York, Tokyo, and Singapore. James has appeared live on Bloomberg television on numerous occasions, and most recently was the chief investment officer of the Sherpa Funds, a fully automated algorithmic hedge fund. He also trains financial market participants in a broad range of subjects, including technical analysis, behavioral finance, and game theory. We are excited and privileged to host you today, James. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation, and over to you. Thank you, Ankita, for the very warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. And I will go straight into a presentation, understanding the linkage between behavioral biases and investment. I'll talk to start with about some of the key behavioral biases that investors and traders have. And then we'll look at the markets as we see them today and see if we can identify and identify some biases there. A picture of me, one of the Bloomberg interviews while I was in Asia. And so what is behavioral finance exactly? It's the study of the influence of psychology on the behavior of financial practitioners and the subsequent effect on the markets. To shorten that down, behavioral finance is why we make irrational decisions. So start with the question. A few questions that will help highlight some of the biases we have. Some research done by Professor Odian and his team, Barbara, Lee, and Louis. They studied 360,000 day traders over a 15 year period. What percentage do you think lost money? 33% A, B, 54%, C, 68%, D, 76%, or E, 87%. This was taken from 1992 to 2007, 15 year period, 360,000 day traders. The correct answer is in fact, E, 87% lost money. Those that made money every year was just 0.28%. So one in 360. Now day trading is particularly hard. In fact, it's become even harder with the introduction of high frequency algorithms, which can execute trades as quickly as three milliseconds. What that means is intraday, we see much more volatility. Even so now we can see retail brokers, they have to disclose the profitability of their traders, their customers, and actually now retail traders Fifty percent. You can see here from the chart every single currency. Retail traders had more profitable trades 
than they had losing trades. Came in around 54%. So if retail traders have more winning trades than more losing trades, why do so many lose money? Well, what they also identified was that the average loss per trade far outweighed the average profit. Money management, risk management. Loss aversion and the disposition effect. The way we've developed, evolved over thousands of years, one of those characteristics when it comes to trading is if we have a winning trade, we typically like to close the trade. We like the confidence of locking in the profit. If we have a losing trade, on the other hand, we don't like to accept losses. We're overconfident with our views. So we typically think the trade will come back to profit. Also, we don't like accepting the loss. So we typically gamble with our losses. Consistent trading, profitable trading is about small profits, small losses and big profits. It's about eradicating the big losses. But what we naturally typically do is we cut our profits early so we don't have the big profits and we run our losing trades. What's worse is if a losing trade then comes back to flat and we close that position. Big sigh of relief. Cortisol in our body, that sickening feeling when you're losing money, that disappears when you close the trade out. You wipe the sweat off your forehead, big relief, and you move on to the next trade. There's two big problems with that. First of all, you close the trade actually when it was moving back in the direction that you first foresaw. The bigger problem, though, is you've been rewarded for holding a losing position. Next time you have a losing position, you have the confidence to hold it until it comes back to flat. You might get away with it. But at some point, you'll have a losing position that turns into a big loss. It might even become an Enron, a Bear Stearns, or something like that. Lots of research done on profitable traders, the top hedge fund managers, the top investment bankers. I've even seen research that saw at one hedge fund, the top 10% of traders, their win ratio was just 41%. So they had far more losing trades than they had profitable trades, but they were still incredibly profitable because their losses were always small. As soon as a trade started losing money, they cut it. So they had small profits, small losses, and big profits. What we need is a process. Again, I'm a big proponent of technical analysis. I was incredibly lucky when I first started in the financial markets in the early 1990s. I joined Daiichi Kangyo Bank, it was the biggest bank in the world at the time. I arrived at nine o'clock on Monday morning, I was walked into the dealing room, shown my seat, introduced to my new manager, Keith Broughton. And at approximately 9.30, the head of the dealing room came over. He bowed to me. And he gave me a piece of paper and he said, James, son, here are your derivatives trading limits. I was pretty young and naive. I turned to Keith and I said, Keith, what's a derivative? He burst out laughing and he said, I think you better read this book. And he gave me John J. Murphy's Introduction to Technical Analysis. Technical Analysis from day one, a year and a half later, we had the bond crash and I was in a very profitable position, and I was offered a job to move to Credit Suisse. It wasn't until about seven years ago, I started to study behavioral finance. Favorite book I read there was Behavioral Investing by James Montier. But when I read this book, about 700 pages, I laughed and I cried the whole way through the book, because every single bias in there, I could relate to myself. So profitable trading, again, it's about small profits, small losses and big profits, but it's about having a process. We'll look a bit later about how we're seeing the Robin Hood traders, the resurgence of retail trading in the US, um, the impact that's had on the market and some of the behavioral biases there. What I 
also found interesting though was when I left banking and set up a fund and started to do back testing. When I was at a bank, certainly for the first 16 years while I was at Credit Suisse and Daiichi Kangyo Bank, I was market making as well as proprietary trading. I called myself a trader, but each day I was having money putting into my trading book by the sales desk. I was quoting FX forwards. We had flow coming in. So I had profit of, profit of between five and $10,000 a day put into my book. And at the end of the day, I'd pat myself on the back and call myself a trader. I was taking proprietary risk, but a lot of the PL that came into my book, especially at the start of the year, was actually flow from sales. So I got a full sense of security. I became overconfident and I took bigger risk. What I didn't do was I didn't take journals. I didn't monitor each individual trade. I was market making STIRT products, short-term interest rate products. In Tokyo, it was the yen swaps. Uh, when I moved to Singapore, it was yen and Kiwi markets. I could also proprietary trade any G10 FX or interest rate product. I would have multiple trades on. I would have yen futures. I would have Kiwi two-year swaps. I would have euro dollar currencies. At the end of the day, my PL, I'd do a reval and I'd pat myself on the back. I didn't look at individual trades. I didn't have a really detailed process. I did use technical analysis, but I also had two big losses in my career. Both of these times, I was so overconfident with my view that I ignored the technicals. Here's the frustration. Both fundamental views were actually correct, but I took too big a position on too early and had the two big, biggest losses in my career. Interestingly, one was at the start of the financial crisis. We could see the financial crisis unfolding. New Zealand interest rates were up close to 8%. We could see on our internal bulletin boards, the money market desk talking about the desperation banks were having, calling up, trying to raise money, raise dollars. We could see the mortgage-backed security desk talking about the market completely freezing. I started to receive aggressively two-year interest rate swaps. The equity market, S&P had fallen about 8%. And then the Federal Reserve came out and said, we're monitoring the situation. We're ready to cut rates if necessary. All of a sudden, equity market said, what crisis? Equities went to all-time highs. And there I was, trade of a lifetime, actually having to be stopped out because I lost so much money because I put too big a position on too early before the trend had actually started to move lower. Thankfully, I managed to get back into the trade at a later date, but just with a small position to start with because I'd been hurt. Again, I had a fundamental view. And fundamental analysis tells us what the trend is going to be. Technical analysis tells us about the execution, when to enter, when to get out. Behavioral finance tells us we need discipline, we need self-awareness, and it highlights many of the bubbles that we have and how human psychology leads us to make investing errors. So for these traders that lose money, the average loss typically far outweighs the average profit. We need money management, risk management, we need a process. We need discipline. Here's a question for you. If I was to give you a set of trading rules that would consistently make money, would you be able to follow those rules? Everybody says yes. A good example, the turtle traders. Richard Dennis and William Eckhart were running a fund. Richard Dennis, 1970 to 1980. He started with about $1,900 and he turned that into $200 million within 10 years. So they agreed to train some trainees, turtles, they called them. 
they put an advertisement out. Many, many people applied for the job. They took on 23 people, 21 men and two women. They took two weeks to train them. It was a simple breakout rule around similar to a four week rule, two weeks to train them. And then they let them start to trade. Within five years, the Turtles had made $175 million. But, and here's the big but, several dropped out within the first three months because they were unable to follow the rules. They'd hired the best 23 people they could identify, and they were very clever people. Some came from a, a accountancy background, another came from trading on the Kansas board um, exchange. But even they picked the best 23 Eve, and they were given a set of rules that consistently made money. Even then, some of them weren't able to follow the rules. If we have a process, we need discipline. The problem with discipline is our emotions. Fear and greed. And we'll look at these and how they're impacting the current market a little bit later again. You need self-awareness as well to be a good trader, to be consistent. It doesn't so matter so much what your personality traits are, it's that you understand what your personality traits are. The best psychometric test, the NEOAC test, I've done it twice myself, two years apart, one with a clinical psychologist from John Hopkins University in the US, one with a professor from Cebu University, Indonesia, sorry, in the Philippines. And what was interesting is the results came back exactly the same. Some of the biases I have, overly positive, which is a great life trait to have, but it's not so good in trading. You need to be positive because you will have small losses. But if you're overly positive, you typically focus on the profits instead of the risks. I'm typically overconfident with my views and I'm typically over aggressive with my trading. The 10% of traders who put on the most trades, their annual returns are 7% lower than the 10% of traders who put on the least trades. What works in my favor is the NEOAC psychometric test is neuroticism. It looks at extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Conscientiousness, I'm particularly high. All these are broken down into six subsets, C1 and C2, which includes duty and order. I score particularly high in. So actually, I'm a better process trader, trading with a set of rules as opposed to discretionary trading. So we need discipline, we need to be aware of our behaviors and we need to be able to master them. Most people simply say, should I buy, should I sell? Whether it's gold, the dollar, Tesla, people want to know, cryptocurrencies of course, we can't leave Bitcoin out of this. People say, should I buy or should I sell? They don't look at the process. Research suggests that only 4% of investors use three steps of strategic thinking. Well, if we're correct more than 50% of the time, what becomes more important is where do we have our stop loss? In fact, do we have a stop loss? I've worked with a team of private bankers where seven out of 25 were happy to run trades without stop losses. Where do we take profit? probably the hardest um, skill to master. Position sizing is critical. Also, we need to look at upcoming economic data, um, events that could affect our positions. Another issue we have is we like narratives. We like looking at Twitter. We follow what we call the experts. Um, we like narratives, but this is just perception. It's not fact. The one fact we have that we can trade off is price. Again, some more research. 
from again Professor Odian, Barber and Zhang in 2001 and Frazzini in 2004. Key biases again, why do we lose money? Retail investors are typically two and a half times more likely to close a winning position than a losing position. But we know if we want to be profitable, we need to cut our losses and run our profits. But what do we do? We cut our profits and we run our losses. Even hedge fund managers are typically at 1.7 times more likely to close a winning position than a losing position. Best performing funds were those with the highest percentage of losses realized. The worst performing funds were those with the lowest percentage of losses realized. And what about when we have a position and we put a stop loss and a take profit order into the trading platform or with a broker? We've got that, what should we do? We should sit on our hands. Patience is one of the hardest disciplines in trading. But even when we have a position on and we have a stop loss in place and a take profit in place, traders are still then 373% more likely to close a profitable trade than a losing trade. Overconfidence, a key bias we have. 74% of fund managers rate their performance as above average in comparison to their peers. 93% of American male drivers write their, rate their driving ability as above average. So never climb into a car with an American male driver who thinks he drives below average. As I just said, the most active traders the top 10%, those that put on the most trades, have 7% lower annual returns compared to the least active. Those, the 10% put on the least trades. It's been proven that women are more consistent and profitable traders than men, typically because of testosterone. Men have seven to nine times more testosterone than women. Research shows they have bigger position sizes and they put on more trades over-aggressive trading and over-trading. Also, the folly of forecasting. April 2000, at the peak of the NASDAQ bubble, 98.4% of equity analysts gave buy or hold recommendations just before the NASDAQ bubble burst and the market collapsed. 2014, 100%, 68 out of 68 bond market analysts expected the US 10-year yield to rise for the year it fell. Again, I'm not picking here on economists and analysts who forecast. It's an impossible job. It's the hardest job in the world. If on December the 31st, 2019, I was to tell you the last day of last year, I was to tell you that the COVID pandemic would strike the world. That in December, in 12 months time, US hospitalizations each day, at the moment it's between I think 170 and 211,000 peak we've had in the last week. We'd have economic data starting to fall again. And we have over 700,000 Americans losing their job each week. Even now, nine months after the first lockdown in New York, we have more Americans losing their job each week than any point in history since the data was first taken in 1965. If I told you all that, would you still think that the NASDAQ would be up 38.5% on the year? Again, even if you know the facts, could you predict where the market would go? Again, another reason why forecasting fundamental analysis has become so very hard. We have algorithms, trend following algorithms. Um, JP Morgan estimated in the fourth quarter of last year that something like 90% of all trades executed on the New York Stock Exchange were executed by algorithms. Of course, a lot of that is high frequency, 
but by far the biggest low latency strategy is trend following. Fast forward to March and lockdown, then we suddenly had the resurgence of retail traders, the Robin Hood traders. We had people working from home, we have people with stimulus checks, and we had the sports gamblers who had no live sport to gamble on. They moved in back into the equity markets and chat rooms. People look at chat rooms for their investing. 78% of affluent millennials get their investment advice from social media compared to just 18% of Gen X and Gen Y. So what happens when these retail traders discuss on their chat rooms what to buy? They start to buy, well, as they do, another type of retail algorithm, a sort of hedge fund algorithm starts buying. The big hedge funds like Citadel, Virtu, Two Sigma, Wolverine, they have algorithms that monitor Twitter, stock tweets, chat rooms like this. When a company name starts to go viral, they look at the share price. And if the share price is going up, these algorithms buy. So you have retail traders buying en masse. We'll look at some examples of that in a minute. You have hedge funds sentiment algorithms that are front running them because they're monitoring the chat rooms. And then you have the trend following algorithms that start buying as well. If I can bring in a um, Bloomberg chart, this is the S&P. Hopefully you can see it very clearly. But what we had in the sell-off in December 2018 was the third most aggressive sell-off ever after 1929 and 1987. We then had, beginning of 2019, the most aggressive rally ever. Well, we've just had, March of this year, the most aggressive sell-off ever, followed by the most aggressive rally. We now have record hedge fund leverage and positioning equities. I was looking this morning, we have, I have the chart later as well, I just put them into the slides. Um, copper, the biggest CFTC data shows the biggest long position ever in copper. And we have the asset managers, the biggest short position ever in the dollar. We have this positioning, we have these trend following algorithms. We have markets moving more aggressively. What it means is markets are starting to move towards more extreme levels. Trend following means it can go farther, but we seem to be getting to fairly extreme levels. When the markets do turn, it could be tomorrow, it could be next month, it could be next year, then it will be, again, aggressive sell-off because the market is so concentrated. Again, the illusion of knowledge. Stephen Hawking said that the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. Here's a chart. I'm just looking at the time. We're doing well for time. This was the S&P two days before the US election last month, trading down near the September lows. The big fear was of, for the markets, what was being discussed, the big fear was a Biden win would be bad for markets. And if Republicans won Senate, then it would be a stalemate on Capitol Hill. Two days before, um, or the day before the election, all of a sudden, equity markets started to rally. The polls were favoring Biden and then the narrative put to it was, it looked like a, a blue sweep. Biden was going to win and the Democrats would win um, Senate. So there'd be no stalemate on Capitol Hill. Apparently that was good for equities. Then when the results started to come out, it started to, the polls suddenly swang in Donald Trump's favor. Then equities kept going up, especially the Nasdaq. The narrative then was that, well, this is good for stocks because there's going to be less regulation on tech stocks. Then as the day drew on, the results came out 
and next days and weeks, it became apparent that Biden was going to win mm-hmm. and Donald Trump, or sorry, Biden would win the presidency and the Republicans would win Senate. Two days before the election, this was the worst case scenario. People feared social unrest. This was the worst case for no- scenario for stocks. It actually played out. If you knew the actual result beforehand, you'd have expected the market to go down. But what happened? November equities had the best month ever. Russell 2000 had the best month ever. Dow Jones had the best month since 1987. Of course, we did have good vaccine news in there. But certainly days the vaccine news came out, the market actually had a massive jump, opened massively higher, but closed lower on the day. Again, a quote I write up to remind myself all the time, trade what's happening, not what you think is going to happen. So are we rational, more rational now? Brief look at some bubbles in the past before we look at the markets right now. Tulip mania, of course, in 1630, the price of flowers, tulips in Holland was going up so quickly, it seemed logical to sell your house and invest in tulip bulbs. Of course, it ended badly. The South Sea bubble in 1711 in England, people were buying a stock, the South Sea Company. It had already gone up 400% in four months, was valued at a 12th of the country's GDP. People continued to buy until, of course, it collapsed. In 1989, the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. It's a large, it's, it's not a huge palace like Versailles or Buckingham Palace. It's more a very large home like the White House. But the Imperial Palace is mainly one square kilometre of grass. I used to run around it lunchtime when I was working in Japan. In 1989, that was worth more than all the real estate in California until that bubble imploded. In March 2000, the market cap of Yahoo was 25 times greater than the market cap of the Chinese equity market. In 2008, the combined assets of Iceland's three biggest banks were 14 times the size of the nation's GDP. An interesting point with bubbles is they often occur with technology inventions, whether it be the railroad bubble and railways, uh, the Mississippi bubble, steamships, the internet, the NASDAQ bubble, and the Bitcoin bubble of 2017. Amara's law says we typically overestimate the impact of technology in the short run and we underestimate the impact of technology in the long run. Certainly Bitcoin in 2017, it was only really being used then for illegal transactions or transactions on the dark web. Now distributed distributed ledger technology is fascinating. Um, Ethereum and what's built on Ethereum, so Rev3's quarter and JP Morgan's quorum. Um, you have trade finance, for instance, prime brokerage, um, exchanges, all recording their data on distributed ledgers. Um, Mediledger is being used to identify fake uh, medical goods. Louis Vuitton, amongst others, are using distributed ledger technology to identify or track their goods. De Beers are tracking diamonds. Amara's Law, a classic example of technology being overestimated in the short run with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but being underestimated in the long run. Certainly now it's already distributed ledger technology is incredible what it's doing and it's here to stay. Here's some bubbles from the past. Are we more rational now? Well, bring in the retail traders from the US and example, three stocks, Hertz, JCPenney and Chesapeake Energy. The 9th of June, all of them had already declared bankruptcy. They'd filed for chapter 11 and yet the 
retail traders started to discuss them in certain chat rooms. They started to buy. And on the 9th of June, even though they'd filed for Chapter 11, Hertz went up 114%. JC Penny went up 96%. Chesapeake Oil went up 175% in one day. Hertz went up 1,250% in the following week. In fact, before then, before it went up, you can see from the chart bottom left, when the Robin Hood share price fell from $20, sorry, when the Hertz share price fell from $20 to $1, retail traders' holdings went up tenfold. The worst possible thing or trading strategy you can do is to add to a losing trade as it goes down. That's what they did. And you can see bottom right, you can see the sudden leap in retail investor equity trading activity from March onwards. We'll have a chart showing, uh, highlighting this again a bit later. So a huge resurgence in retail trading, much more aggressive. We've seen it in Asia before. In 2000, April 2015, a three month period, we saw the Shanghai Composite rally aggressively. Think of the top of my head, it was April 2015. And what we saw in commodity markets was more interesting. We saw iron ore and cotton prices almost double in a three month period. What was interesting though, on the Dalian exchange alone, we saw volume go up 30 times. So each day on the Dalian exchange, the amount of iron ore trading equal to China's annual imports and the amount of cotton trading was enough to make a pair of jeans for everybody on the planet every day. Again, there's a difference when we have a position and it starts making money and we know people around us are making money, then all of a sudden we don't want to close the trade. We do the other extreme. Greed and certain other biases then come into play. Jealousy of our neighbor, fear of missing out. So we can start adding to winning positions. We go from one extreme to the other. Also, overconfidence and confirmation bias. The more we look at chat rooms, the more people are buying the Hertzes and the Chesapeake Energies, the more confident we become because we're looking for people that confirm our views. We aggressively add to winning trades, which means when the market does turn, we have our biggest position on and then we're losing more money on the way down than we made on the way up. Again, because we're overconfident, people tend then to not have stop losses in place with fairly fatal um, consequences because the leaders when the market goes down are the algorithms. One other case, we have Nicola um, in June. Nikola, named after Nikola Tesla, Nikola's Tesla, um, famous inventor. Tesla, of course, makes electric cars. Nikola was a concept company to make electric trucks. Nikola has not made one electric truck. It has zero revenue. Yet again, retail traders started to buy it. It went up 104% in one day. And even though it only had $1.1 million of cash in the bank. It had no revenue, no product. It was valued at $33 billion. Again, fundamental analysis becomes very difficult to trade when markets are going up this aggressively. Again, quick chart, one taken this morning, shows total US equity call volumes. You can see call volumes almost three times now what they were average of last year. The market is aggressively trading upside, record leverage. We have record valuations, Russell 2000, 
stocks where there's a record number of Rus Russell 2000 stocks that are actually losing money. Um, but the market is trending higher. So the trend is up. Important to watch the price signal for when the market turns. Um, herd mentality, I've mentioned when everybody is trading together, well, when retail traders are trading together, they're actually being front run by the algorithms, monitoring the chat rooms, all fully automated. When retail traders start to buy Hertz, Nikola, Tesla, the algorithms are buying in front of them. The moment the retail trading starts to diminish, the algorithms are taking their profit. Fear of missing out. Another example of certainly irrational trading here. People, 18th of June of this year, people buying the Ethereum ETF that was trading at a 515% premium to Ethereum. People just wanted to buy the product without looking at the actual fundamental value of the product. Um, there was an ETF, uh, a crypto ETF, just a few weeks ago, I think it was the Litecoin ETF, Grayscale Litecoin ETF, I think off the top of my head, but it was trading at a 1,200% premium. Again, completely irrational behavior. Are we rational? A famous quote from Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, your mistaken professors were too much influenced by rational man models of human behavior from economics and too little influenced by foolish man models from psychology and real world experience. Um, I do have five more slides after this, so we have plenty of time for some questions at the end. But here's charts on Tesla. Don't get me wrong, Tesla is a fantastic company, a great car. Everyone I know that has a Tesla loves it. But the chart bottom left shows the market cap of Tesla per unit sold. This was in 2019. Well, in the last 12 months, Tesla sales have gone up 15%, but the share price has gone up 900%. When I studied economics at university, again, it was a few decades ago, I remember a company stock 12% PE ratio was seen as a 12 PE ratio was seen as cheap. 18% was seen as relatively expensive. Well, recently Tesla was at 916 times price to earnings. Um, up a slide here. Again, I have to update this one every day. I created this slide last week, but this one I updated again uh, this morning because yesterday's move a year ago, the post stock split price a year ago when Tesla was trading around 70, there was a massive push by hedge funds to short Tesla. Looking at historical valuation models saying it was overpriced. Well, the first quarter of this year, Tesla was trading at 120. Even, even Elon Musk, the CEO said that the Tesla share price was overvalued when it was 120. Well, by July, it was trading at 200. It went up 80% in the next 10 trading days. It's got up to 600 two days ago. It went up another seven odd percent yesterday, trading at 640. Again, is this rational? Tesla is a great stock. Would I be buying it here? So Tesla is a great company big difference to a great stock. Would I be buying it here? Absolutely not. Would I be shorting it? It's too volatile. And at the moment, the trend is still going higher. Marty Schwartz, a famous stock trader said, most people think they're playing against the market, but the market doesn't care. You're really playing against yourself. Behavioral finance is about understanding our biases. There's about 28 key biases, something like 148 biases he have in total. Human psychology. It's about understanding that, understanding ourselves, having a process, being disciplined and mastering our emotions. 
if we have a process and we're disciplined, then we don't need to worry about our emotions. I mentioned earlier how we make decisions, our personality. Our personality is typically ingrained by the time we're 23 years old. Certain influences, the upbringing we had, the circumstances we're in, the people around us, education, our friends. The NEOAC psychometric test looks at neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness. Again, it doesn't matter so much where you are. It's understanding your personality, your emotions. It's good if you're trading. Actually, it's you need to have a journal, but part of your journal should not just be, why did I put this trade on? It should also be, how am I feeling? If I'm feeling overconfident, euphoric, if I've got winds behind me. A great example of this. One year, um, my target, I'd beaten my target. I was almost 180% of my target um, by the end of March. This was about 2005. Um, so I'd beaten my target. I was almost doubled my target. It was just three months into the year. The head of the desk in Singapore called me into the office. He said, James, you're doing brilliantly. We had a call yesterday, the global head of Sturt and the global head of fixed income. Discussed last night, you're trading really well. We're keen that you really go for it this year. We double your limits if you want. So go for it. We got our full backing. We're ready to double your limits. Um, yeah, absolutely go for it. I went out the office feeling pretty good. Within two weeks, I'd given back half my profit. Again, completely based around overconfidence. So our personality, again, write down, have a mental awareness. How am I feeling today is a really important point to ask. Some people say they trade on gut instinct. Here's a good example of why I completely disagree with that. Um, I used to row for Great Britain. I still do Ironman triathlons around the world. I keep fit. I love it. If I have a position on that's losing money, again, I have a process. I have a stop loss in place. I'm not too bothered. But what I notice is if my gut feeling is, well, this trade's going to stop out. I don't feel particularly good about it. If I go for a run, if I run, I typically run a really hard 5K or I live in beautiful countryside here, I'll do maybe a 10 to 20K slow but steady run. When I get back, the endorphins in my body, I feel really good. I have a shower. I sit down, look at my screen. That same trade now looks really good. The gut feel is all positive, purely because I just went for a run. The endorphins in my body change completely the way I feel about that trade. Nothing has fundamentally changed. So that's one reason why I don't believe in gut in instinct. Briefly, how do we, how the brain makes decisions? The amygdala is where we, our, our risk appetite. Basically, some people like skydiving and jumping out of planes. Other people don't. That's based around the amygdala. Again, risk management, position sizing is critical. The core the central part of the brain where we make instant decisions. If a car swerves up onto the pavement, we jump out the way. But the cortex, the outer part of the brain, is where we make long-term rational decisions. When we're under extreme pressure, our body shuts down certain functions. Again, this is through thousands of years development. When we lived in caves and bears and bulls used to attack, our body would shut down, didn't need to send blood to our digestive system. It needed to send blood to our muscles so we could fight or flight. What it does when we're under extreme pressure, it shuts down blood going to the cortex. So we can't make logical long-term decisions. This is why sports people under pressure can make errors. This is why people on stage can forget their lines because the limbic system 
under pressure shuts down blood going to the part of the brain where we make stable decisions. Chemicals in our body as well, dopamine and cortisol. If we're nervous, we're doing a presentation in front of a thousand people, we feel nervous. A sporting event, an exam, that's cortisol. The same feeling you have when you're losing money. Dopamine is euphoria. You finish the sporting event, you walk out, finish the exam, or you finish your presentation, you feel euphoric. That's dopamine. Dopamine is the feeling you get when the position comes back. It was losing money, but it comes back. All of a sudden, the Fed cut rates, equities go back, you feel good again. That's dopamine. The problem here is the combination of cortisol and dopamine is the most addictive chemicals known to the human brain. Again, with trading, again, it can stimulate this. What we need is a process. So just a couple more slides and a great example of how our brain makes irrational decisions. Um, two groups of people. One, they were given a pain reliever. One group was given a pain reliever called Velodone. They were told it cost $2.50. After 10 minutes, 92% of people experienced pain relief. Another group, a separate group, were also given Velodone, but they were told it cost only 10 cents. This time, only 50% of people experienced pain relief. Actually, it was vitamin, Velodone was vitamin C tablets. It was not a pain reliever at all. Just an example of how our brain works. I mentioned record positioning, non-commercial combined positions, record longs of copper, record shorts of dollar, the most leveraged long position ever in US equity markets. Um, you've seen the call option buying. We have pretty extreme sentiment in markets, yet we have um, Goldman Sachs came out calling for equity markets or S&P to go to 4,200 at the end of next year. I think it was 4,500 at the end of 2022. We do have huge amounts of stimulus from the central bank and we have more fiscal policy coming through and we have a vaccine. Interesting times to be looking at the markets. Final slide, what I tend to do is uh, algorithms that look at three month trends. Back testing, I've identified with, I have um, a core 60 equities, indices, ETFs, commodities, bonds, and currencies I look at. Over 10 years, they were in a three month trend just over 0.26% of the time. So I've algorithms built around this looking to these three month trends identified by looking at nine consecutive weeks where the close was lower than the close three weeks earlier. So I've algorithms built around this and intermediate trends if you're familiar with Dow theory. So I actually have some videos I've produced on those which I will be releasing um, in January. Um, around technical analysis, behavioral finance, and peak performance. So just to finish, um, I'll actually be releasing those on Twitter, so you can actually follow me on Twitter. I'm James R. Brody. There is an R in the middle. Um, but that brings me to the end. Um, just run over a few minutes, but we do have some time for some questions. Hopefully, it's been interesting. These are fascinating markets we're looking at right now. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, James. Uh, it was rather very insightful and we did see some of the very fascinating data points in your presentation. I think we'd be using more of them uh, in our narratives as we progress on our own research path. Uh, but about uh, what you were asking, there are a couple of questions from the audience that I would rather like to merge. Uh, one being that the problem with discipline is fear and greed. Uh, and so at one extreme where we stand today, there has been a remarkable bull run, something that's considered once in a lifetime opportunity 
for a lot of young traders who've entered the market recently there is a factor of jealousy as you say when you say uh, when you see people around you making money so how difficult uh, is it to cultivate discipline at that point and secondly uh, are you saying that individuals who are already sorted in their head can be prof- profitable traders uh, how does one stop those personal biases on what we are seeing around us uh, to sink into our trading strategies and if one is aggressive as a person uh, is it necessary that uh, his or her trading returns will be subpar is there some strategy that we can follow us you know one two three step to do better with trading despite having a personality which gets affected by greed and fear okay uh, thank you ankita uh, lots of questions there i'll try and pick through a few of them um firstly it's great to try and understand our personality you can do some of these uh, personality tests online but another way to do it is just to journal to write about how you're feeling when you put trades on you start to become aware of certain feelings then um you can do the NEOAC personality psychometric tests there's certain books on this as well um but certainly journaling will help you understand some of the biases that you may have when you're trading um great way to overcome this is to actually build a process um as you mentioned earlier i'm out, i'm on the board of the chartered market technicians association again technical analysis is a great way to do this building a trend following a set of rules um one i i like um the 8 and 21 day moving average i will only ever buy if they're both going up i will only ever sell if they're both going down very very simple rule but that will help get me into a 3 month trade quite early on the chartered market technicians association it's the biggest the finest technical analysis body in the world they have three books they have three exams you can actually buy the books you don't need to do the exams necessarily but will introduce you to lots of strategies like this um as i say i'm creating some videos myself i'll be releasing next month on um twitter as well but it's about building a process then if you have a process then you'll start to see how your behaviors try and affect it if you have a stop loss but you want to take the trade off beforehand then you'll you'll see that again your biases and your emotions are getting involved if you're long of let's say tesla and it's going up fantastic don't get over exuberant make sure you have a stop loss so you identify well if the stop is triggered what is my profit then again it's about building a process to overcome your emotions um i think hopefully i i've covered there were several questions in there as well but it's about having a process then it's about the discipline of keeping to the process and the discipline is about mastering mastering yourself your own self awareness and a great way to do it you know, technical analysis will help you build a process then keeping a journal will help you understand how the trades are performing if you need to change your process but also understand your own behaviors and your emotions sure uh so i think a process oriented approach to investing is what uh you've been talking about now james how do you make sense of the market's mind so you know markets are discounting certain things at a time let it be uh, talk about joe biden's victory or the rally that we saw just after the lockdown and while we were rather in the lockdown so there are certain things that markets are discounting at a particular time how do you resolve and make sense of those a great question if you go on to twitter there's lots of people talking about the market going higher because again one thing i forgot to mention m2 money supply is up over 25% this year the stimulus quantitative easing 21% of all us dollars in circulation were created this year we have more a fiscal package coming through soon we have a vaccine so fingers crossed you know early next year we'll finally be able to put covid crisis behind us so there's plenty of reasons for the market to go higher but at the same time we have 
record valuations, particularly Russell 2000, with a record number of companies that are losing money. We have the biggest long position ever in copper um, for non-commercial speculators. Asset managers, biggest short ever in the dollar. We have these huge positionings, which typically means it doesn't mean the trend in copper and the dollar has to end, but it means at some point we'll get a violent reaction. I can go onto Twitter. I can see people saying why stocks should go up. I can see people justified why stocks should go down. This is another reason why I personally find fundamental analysis quite difficult because trying to pick between those is impossible. That's why I find the only facts, I avoid narrative and I, I head for facts, which is price. Sure, James. Um, so for the audience who've not been able to locate the chat box, please put in your questions uh, there. Uh, and we'll put it uh, to James during the session. But I'm sorry about the technical glitch we faced uh, right now, but I was asking James, as he also mentioned in his narrative about uh, dollar index being oversold, it's crashing below 91 uh, today, uh, the short contracts at its high. So I was asking James about his expectations uh, in the next three months on the DXY and S&P 500. Thank you. Um, so the dollar, again, it's trading, it's trending lower. Um, so for the moment, the trend is your friend. Stick with the trend. There will be a point where the market turns up. That's when the algorithms will close their positions. Um, if you take the euro dollar, currently trading at 121, the key support is down at 116. So again, algorithms I use are trend following are built around the 8 and 21 day moving averages. There's certain other uh, topics involved in there. I have volatility components, um, oscillators in there as well. But when the 8, the shorter term algorithm starts to turn down, well, then I'll close the positions. You'll see hedge funds, positions, algorithms closing, first of all. But a lot of fundamental traders won't have their stop until it gets down to 116 and trades below there. Fundamentally, yes, the huge increase in supply of the US dollar this year is what's weighing on it. But the flip side, the euro at these levels is becoming particularly painful for exporters in the euro area. So we may expect to see some verbal intervention there. But at the moment, the trend, you have to stick with the trend. Mean reversion strategies that I look at, look at around standard deviations. When it's traded around extreme standard deviations, then I want to see a weekly close move in the opposite direction. So we've gone through those standard deviations. So when I see the dollar index trade at above the close of the previous week, that will tell us, yes, the market's gone to an extreme, but now the buyers are coming back in. Um, I have an algorithm based around that. But what will happen, you have such crowded positions, it will be an aggressive move when it happens. The impact of the dollar when it happens rallying aggressively, and it may be a long-term trend that has another 20% to go, but there's uh, there will be a retracement in between that will be aggressive. That will have a big impact on commodities, emerging market equities, and we'll see a big knock-on effect. So all these trades are trading, they're very highly correlated. So the S&P at the same time, um, that's going up when the dollar turns, will almost certainly be when the S&P turns. Um, again, can't pin packed, pinpoint exactly, but the trend is higher, but the charts will show it, the price action will show it. Typically, when I see a, a lower close on the weeklies on the S&P, we see the eight day moving average, that's a signal to close the trend following positions and the weekly close low in the previous week is typically when the extreme standard deviations have been reversing from there and the mean reverting strategies kick in. But with the stimulus coming, yeah, the markets are trending, the price action will tell us when. And this again, one final point, this is one risk with fundamental trading. If you were trying to 
short Tesla on a fundamental view a year ago when it was trading at 70. Now it's trading at 641. So you have a fundamental view. You'd still, even if you're a fundamental trader, you still need to wait for the price action to confirm the change in direction. Sure, James. So you've, you've kind of answered my next question, uh, which was um, in a long-term trend. And as you said, trend is our friend. Uh, most people end up finding a suited entry point, but it's the exit point that people struggle with. And also the sizing strategy of the position. So uh, do you have uh, something, some sort of advice on how to appropriately size one's position uh, also on the exit strategy front? Certainly position sizing. What we had at the fund, we had, we built a position sizing tool around the Kelly criterion, K-E-L-L-E-Y. Um, you can find it on the internet. It's a simple, um, based on your expected win ratio and your expected profit. Of course, if you have data, you've done back testing, you know that very accurately. And this was created by the card counters, the film 21, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology card counters. They went to Vegas, they could count cards. They knew they could beat the casinos at the cards. What became critical was their position sizing. So we built a position sizing tool using that, but we also took into account volatility. Um, so that's one way. And typically people have too big a position. Typically uh, a trade should be about between one to 2% of your assets that you're managing. Another strategy though, um, you could use if is the Nightingale strategy where you're scaling into positions. What's critical here, if it's a long-term trend and you're scaling into it, is that you have a stop that's close by. Um, with the fund, we traded G10FX because it's a 24-hour market. We knew we could always get out of the trade. If you're trading, for instance, a tech stock and bad earnings come out and the following day the tech opens 10% lower, well, then it blows right through your tight stop. So you can, if you are going to add to winners, then you need to have it critical where you have your stop loss. Um, and it's no point doing it off a percentage, 1% or 2% from where it enters the trade, because if you have a policy, a strategy like that, all that happens is when volatility picks up, you are stopped out. The other question, um, taking profit. Um, I remember if you take profit too early, one bias we have, um, loss aversion and disposition effect, we take profit too early, the trade carries on running, well, we kick ourselves, we're frustrated. But then if we take profit too late and we give back a whole load of profit, well, then we're frustrated and we kick ourselves. So we always kick ourselves. So again, what I do, I use it in 27 years of trading, I've never managed to buy at the bottom. I've never managed to sell at the top. Um, unfortunately, I've brought at the top and I've sold at the bottom. Those were the early days. But what I want now, if it's trend following, I want to get the meat, the middle of the trend. So again, I'll use, I like the eight and 21 day moving averages for entry. And I'll use the eight um, with some other rules. This is simplifying it quite a bit to get out. What that means is if it is a three month trend, then with this, I will get a big part of the trend. Of course, I might get stopped out after three minutes. I take that on the chin because I'm going to have small losses and small profits, but I also want to capture the big profits. So that's something I would use. But I never put in an estimate of where I think this is going and I put a take profit in there. It's always a trailing, trailing stop or trailing take profit level built off the moving averages. And again, I am producing some videos on this, so I'll be releasing them next month, which will have some strategies around this as well. Sure, James, that was really helpful uh, for you giving out a very detailed strategy. What do you make of the Indian markets, uh, especially on the equity front's Nifty, but also where USD INR is headed? We've had record flows in the last month, uh, but rupee hasn't appreciated as much as what it was expected to because a central bank was intervening 
um, any trends and uh, any targets on the Indian uh, equity indices, Nifty and USD INR? Um, I was looking beforehand at the Nifty, and it's so highly correlated to the US equity market. Um, right. I'm just pulling the chart right up now. And that one's not coming up. I will pull it up here. The problem is so many markets are correlated to one at the moment. If you look at yen crosses, if we look at um, the equity markets, they are they had their peaks in February. They've had their lows in 23rd of March and they broke all time highs, October, November time. They're highly correlated again. I don't look for long-term targets. Um, I'm just looking at the Nifty right now. It's trending higher. The moving average, shorter term moving averages I look at are trending higher. There's not even close to a trend line being broken. The trend is higher. Again, what I will look at, the eight day moving average is a big warning signal when that starts to turn lower. And of course we have the key support is around the 12,400 level, which was a previous peak in February and March. Um, but right now, now, it's happily trading higher. And another great point is when markets are breaking new highs, we typically find it very hard to buy. We look at charts, it's the top right hand corner of the chart, it looks like it's running out of room. It's actually a great time to buy. Um, it's trending higher, so it's a great time to be long. But again, I would say you have to be nimble. You need stops in place. And when the market turns next week, next month, next year, next month is next year, um, it will be an aggressive move. If I look at the INR, again, what's happened there? The dollar's weakening, but actually it's not like the euro. It's gone sideways from September, October, November, December. And it's in a pretty tight range between just below 75, 74.90 and 73, the figure. That one, again, the dollars traded down to 73.50 today. But it's effectively, from my perspective, that's just in a range 74.90 to 73, the figure. And when it breaks out of that range, I would have no position on at the moment. But when it breaks out of that range, it looks like that will be the next medium term trend. Sure, James. Thanks. Uh, so there, there is one question wherein we all know you've been doing this for about three decades now. You, you track global markets and you track across uh, asset classes. So with all the hustle, what is one theme at the moment that's caught your attention? Um. One theme that's got my attention, what interests me the most is the behavioral side right now of the market with these extremely long positions. Um, the market is trending for sure. Um, there is lots of stimulus in the market, um, but there is certainly overvaluations of a lot of tech stocks. Um, so what interests me is you know, when will the market turn? And again, I can't predict that. I look at the charts of that, but it will become interesting because the move will be very aggressive. What's really interesting, actually, I talk about these three month trends, the sell off we had in March, if I look at the S&P, if I just look at the Nifty as well, was the same. The sell off was only one month. Lots of institutional investors as well as retail didn't get stopped out. They didn't close their positions. Um, Certainly in May, that bounce, and in May, I remember three prominent investors um, talked about the markets bouncing and being overvalued at that time in May. Well, it's gone up ever since we're now in December. Um, in May, there was a, a feeling we were going to get another leg lower. We didn't. The sell-off only actually lasted for one month. Typically, they last for three. So when we do get a sell-off, um, the Fed won't be able to support it to start away, straight away. Um, and the Fed, if anything, needs to let some of the steam out of the market. The problem is when markets move aggressively, too quick and too fast. So what fascinates me at the moment is 
I absolutely believe there's some um, some bubbles in certain markets. I'm not saying the S&P at all, but I'm saying certain stocks within these indexes are showing bubble like um, valuations. Also, we have $18 trillion of negative yielding bonds. We have, I think, $4 trillion of negative yielding corporate bonds. To me, that seems irrational. When we have five-year, five-year forward inflation expectations picking up. Um, so it's not so much the price action, but it's the behavior of participants in the market that um, I find fascinating. Um, and I said, again, as I said, when the market does turn, it will be aggressive but there's still plenty of stimulus in place. The market's trending higher. And until the trend turns, we won't see that move. Yeah, uh, clearly we have seen some unprecedented fundamentals there. So uh, James, uh, as you were mentioning about certain stocks and the rally we've seen, be it in US or be it our domestic rally, it's been driven by a few stocks. Uh, the markets have been very polarized. Uh, if we talk about the FANG group in US or Nifty Stock 5, uh, do you think the as we move forward in this so-called bull run, do you think markets are expected to get more breadth or is it more likely a continuation of trend uh, on polarized stocks, certain stocks doing well? I think it was actually very polarized up till about or up to the election. But what we've seen since the election, actually, I don't have the actual data on it, but we've seen much more breadth since the election, which actually supports the move higher. Um, so that makes it, again, even more interesting. Um, record valuations, record positioning, record leverage, very strong breadth um, supports the rally for the moment. Um, so we're not getting the signals of a turn at the moment. The trend is quite happily going forward. Um, and we yeah, sit on positions, be patient and make sure we're nimble, keep moving our stop losses. Um, and we're nimble for when the market does turn. Okay, thanks, Jim. We've far exceeded the time, but one last question to you. Actually, two last questions to you. Okay. One uh, being, uh, any advices on which books one should read to cultivate uh, discipline and understand more on behavioral finance. And the second being, you are a triathlete, you're an Ironman, you're one of those person who does those crazy things, spends a lot of time outdoors. So does being outdoor and uh, the activities you indulge in beyond trading has an effect on your investing skills? Uh, are there any parallels that you draw and has it benefited you in any way? Absolutely. I'll talk about the exercise first. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I've always done it. I, again, rode for Great Britain for three years and won medals at 323 World Championships. Um, I still train now virtually every day. Um, what, I, what I find, it gives me a lot of discipline. Um, one of the videos I'm producing is about peak performance trading. Um, it gives me great discipline. Um, one thing it doesn't help me is I'm very determined. Um, rowing uh, Ironman, you know, you're running a marathon, having swum 3.8 kilometers, cycled 180 kilometers, and then you have to run 41 kilometers. It's about determination. In markets, determination, I think, is not such a good trait. If you're determined to be right and you keep holding a position, you will end up with a big loss. So that's something I'm aware of, aware of as well. Um, you have to be nimble. The market's telling you, the market's telling you what's happening. If the price is going up, the market's telling you. The price is going down, the market's telling you. If your PL each day is a profit, the market's telling you you're right. If your PL is a loss, the market's telling you you're wrong. So not to be determined, not to be stubborn. But the one great thing that it does is around mindfulness. So if I go for a run or a walk, happy to go for a walk, I cycle a lot. I don't have music in my ear. I just like to enjoy the countryside. Bit of peace, calm and collected, just control my emotions. Um, enjoy the state of mind, enjoy the countryside. Deep breaths, um, breathing techniques can help you as well. Um, deep breath for four seconds, hold for four seconds, release for four seconds, that's a great breathing repeatedly, a great breathing strategy to help you relax. That also keeps you alert. If you want to help with your sleep, 
a great strategy is deep breath for four seconds, hold for seven seconds, release for eight seconds. Keep doing that repeatedly for about a minute, maybe a bit longer. It will help get you in, move you towards deep sleep. Sleep is really important. Um, if you look at the top sports people in the world, the top footballers, the top cricketers, I should mention cricket, of course, um, tennis players, athletes, what do they all have in common? They all have a coach. They're all continually trying to improve. They're all continually looking at their mental state of mind, relaxation, eating well. That's exactly what we need to do if we're trading. There's no shortcuts in trading, unfortunately. Um, but it's a process, discipline, mental awareness, um, and understanding why we typically lose money. Our biases is a great way to progress. Um, as for books, um, behavioral finance, I'm looking at it right now because I'm creating, I'm creating some videos. Um, for technical analysis, my favorite book, the one I first read, John J. Murphy's Introduction to Technical Analysis. For behavioral finance, I like um, Montier's, James Montier's Behavioral Investing. Also, Denise Scholl's Market Mind Games. Sure. Yep. Thanks, James. Some good recommendations for our readers out there. And also, thanks for giving a perspective on life. Uh, you've rightly mentioned is the balance, physical, emotional, mental that we need in trading like we need in any other profession of life. I think it goes with or without uh, whatever you do in life. Those are the essentials checklist that we all should uh, clock. So thanks a lot for your time. Thanks for pleasure. accepting our invitation. It was a pleasure hosting you and we've had a very good evening uh, and a very good end to day one of our conference with your insights. Thanks a lot. Fantastic, Ankita. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.